Bonsoir à tous. Merci, merci d'être venus aussi nombreux ce soir pour ce lundi de la mer exceptionnel. Donc c'est bien sûr au nom de tous les partenaires que je voulais vous citer ensuite, que, que je vous remercie tous, qui, qui venaient d'horizons variés, hein, bien sûr de la filière pêche, mais euh, certains élus, euh, euh, du grand public comme on dit, mais tous les gens, euh, de, aussi bien des scientifiques bien entendu qui sont là, et, et des ONG, euh, voilà l'industrie, enfin voilà, merci à tous d'être là, des journalistes également. Euh, voilà. Et puis merci, bien entendu, à, nous sommes euh, honorés vraiment ce soir d'accueillir euh, notre, notre ami, euh, le professeur Ray Bourne, euh, donc de l'Université de Washington, euh, qui est une, comme ça a été écrit sur le site de l'UBS, une, une pointure euh, au niveau des, des pêcheries, hein, au niveau international, bon, qui a euh, été l'auteur ou qui a contribué à plus de 200, 200 publications euh, de haut niveau. Euh, voilà, donc ça, son domaine, c'est vraiment la gestion des pêches hein, avec une, une vision euh, assez globale. Vous allez voir, bon, j'en dirai pas plus. Euh, vous avez, savez peut-être déjà un petit peu ce qu'il fait, mais euh, voilà, qui a une vision, euh, euh, en tout cas, de, euh, de par le titre déjà de sa conférence, hein, de la nécessité de, de partager les connaissances entre professionnels et scientifiques pour gérer les pêcheries. Ça vous donne déjà un petit peu une idée de, de, de sa, sa vision. Voilà. Et puis donc euh, également, donc je vais surtout pas parler longtemps parce qu'on va lui laisser la parole. C'est ça le plus important évidemment. Euh, merci bien sûr à, à nous, nous. Nous sommes quatre partenaires à avoir organisé cette soirée dans le cadre des, des lundis de la mer. Euh, bien entendu FFP, hein, le France filière pêche, euh, qui donc qui a financé tout ça et puis qui a bien sûr euh, euh, nous, nous a permis aussi à l'Ifremer d'avoir euh, cette réunion euh, privilégiée cet après-midi avec euh, avec Ray, des échanges très très constructifs. Euh, L'UBS évidemment qui nous accueille ici, c'est vraiment l'occasion de, de travailler ensemble en plus et puis bien sûr la Maison de la Mer euh, donc avec qui nous organisons tous les mois c'est les, les Lundis de la Mer, des conférences entre autres, hein, mais on travaille sur pas mal de projets ensemble et puis nous donc l'IFREMER à Lorient voilà, bah, écoutez je vais passer je pense à la parole à Ray euh, je vous remercie de lui, de lui réserver un accueil vibrant <rire> Okay, well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And it is a great pleasure to be here in, uh, in Lorient to be uh, hosted by the four organizations and uh, to see such a, a big crowd on a, on a Monday night. Um, so I'm going to talk about the general area of the relationship between people who catch fish for a living and uh, scientists, and I will also uh, <clears throat> get into uh, management a little bit. Um, this is <clears throat> uh, going to be something of uh, an evening of storytelling. Uh, I don't think I'm going to present any real hard data or any detailed uh, analysis. There will be no statistics. Uh, there will be no equations. Um, It'll just be uh, a lot of my experiences uh, with working with many people uh, on uh, trying to make fisheries successful for uh, the people who make a living at fishing, for uh, the public who has an interest in it, and uh, for the management system. So I want to begin uh, <clears throat> with the Fraser River in Canada. I began my career uh, as, a, as a scientist uh, a little over 40 years ago, working uh, at the time for the Canadian government, uh, uh, dealing with issues of the management of Pacific salmon. And the Fraser River is the biggest river in, uh, in Western Canada, um, or certainly in British Columbia, uh, and it goes right through the heart of British Columbia uh, and uh, supports Uh, the, the largest salmon runs in Canada and some of the largest salmon runs in the world. Um, and uh, unlike the larger rivers in the western United States, the Fraser River has no dams on its main stem. So you, the graph you see, uh, make sure you see it the same I see it, yes, okay. Um, that uh, that river flows free from its headwaters all the way down to the ocean. Uh, and we know with Pacific salmon and with Atlantic salmon 
that the secret to maintaining their productivity is keeping their habitat intact and their ability to reach their habitat uh, free of dams. Um, the biggest uh, uh, equivalent river in the United States is the Columbia River, and it has eight dams on its main stem, the main part of the river. Uh, three times in the last century, dams have been proposed on the Fraser River, uh, and they've been proposed by the government. <laughs> uh, and three times, uh, United Voices have prevented that from happening, and the Fraser River still runs free. And the most dominant voice, the biggest and most successful opponents, has been the fishermen's union and the fishing industry. That there are thousands and thousands of fishermen in, uh, in British Columbia who depend on the Fraser River, and uh, they mounted very po successful political campaigns to prevent dams being built on the Fraser River. For the last 20 years, I've been working on salmon in Alaska. Uh, this lake, Iliamna Lake, is the largest lake in the United States other than the five Great Lakes. And this region, called Bristol Bay, supports uh, the most valuable salmon runs in the world. Uh, last year, we had 58 million sockeye salmon return to uh, the rivers of Bristol Bay. Um, mining companies have found very rich deposits of copper and gold and have proposed uh, a mine in this basic, uh, what's shaded in black is the proposed footprint of the mine. Um, it would be one of the largest open pit mines in the world. Uh, <clears throat> one of the products of the mine would be highly acidic, highly polluted water um, that would need to be stored. And the dam proponents have proposed building 700 foot high, that would be over 200 meter high earthen dams to hold that water and they would have to last forever. That is, the water does not get uh, clean itself over time. Uh, again, uh, in this case, the government did not come out with a position, the, the state government. Uh, the, the state fisheries agency, their staff were told, you cannot say anything about this proposed mine. Uh, the two effective opponents of this mine have been the fishing interests of Bristol Bay, the communities and the fishing companies, the individuals, and a broad series of environmental groups. So both the Fraser River and the proposed pebble mine in Alaska uh, really show how the fishermen recognize where their livelihoods come from and they, uh, when those livelihoods are threatened by the development that will ruin their, the, the, the habitat for their fisheries, they, they have become the most effective habitat protectors. Um, going to the marine world, seabed mining has been proposed in New Zealand. And again, one of the most effective opponents was the New Zealand fishing industry, who depends upon the, some of that same area to catch their fish. Um, so the, the real lesson is that when fishermen have the, uh, the access to a fishery resource and they are not competing with someone else, that is with another country or uh, with, well, with not typically another country, uh, they have a very strong interest in protecting the habitat of their fish resources uh, and are often the most effective protectors. Um, so, I got ahead of myself. Fishing interests can be the best guardians of fisheries resources. It requires having the incentives right. That is, 
the fishermen must have secure access to those resources. Certainly there are lots of examples of places where fishing companies and fishing interests have behaved uh, not in the long-term interest of the resource. In almost all cases, that's where there was competitive situation, often between countries. Um, that is, if fishermen have the exclusive right to harvest, it's in their personal interest and their, their corporate interest and their community interest to protect those resources. So let me just give you an overview of uh, certainly my perception of what are the key elements of good fishery management. The first is you need to understand the catch, what's taken out of the fishery, and the effort that goes into it. Uh, you need to do that so that you can understand the potential productivity of the resource. You need to track the abundance of the population and the characteristics, typically the size distribution, big fish, small fish, and the age distribution. You need to regulate the fishing pressure. Um, and particularly when stocks go down, you have to reduce fishing pressure, and you can allow fishing pressure to increase when stocks go up. Many fisheries catch things that they're not trying to catch. This may range from albatrosses in longline fisheries to turtles in uh, shrimp fisheries to uh, sharks in, in other fisheries. Um, and good fisheries management involves reducing and ideally eliminating what we call bycatch of non-target species. Protecting sensitive habitats. Uh, there are habitats that are very important for fish production. There are habitats that are very important for other aspects of ecosystem functioning. Uh, and good fisheries management identifies and protects those habitats. So this graph is just a, a map of Alaska uh, and shows all those areas shaded are protected in one way or the other for uh, everything from concern about marine mammals to concerns about uh, nursery grounds to the Arctic areas are simply protected at the moment because we know so little about them. And finally, you, can, you have to enforce the regulations. Um, and a good fisheries management system uses a, uh, a wide variety of techniques to inf enforce those regulations. So now let me talk about a couple examples of how uh, fishermen, fishing fleets, fishing companies can work to uh, help provide knowledge to manage their uh, fisheries. And this is a picture of an Australian scientist who's a very good friend of mine, Jeremy Prince. And Jeremy did his uh, PhD degree working on abalone, and he's holding there two uh, abalone from Australia, which are, I believe, the most valuable abalone in the world, and certainly, I think, the, uh, the, most, uh, the healthiest uh, wild abalone stocks. And <clears throat> what Jeremy discovered is, well, let me, let me step back. Uh, abalone are typically managed with a size limit, that you cannot take an abalone uh, that is below a certain size, and that size is set based on at what age they mature. So you try, or what size they mature. So the size limit is ideally larger than the size at which the individuals mature. That means that even if you take every individual above the size limit, you still have some mature individuals producing eggs. Abalone resources have typically been managed uh, within a jurisdiction, in this case Tasmania in Australia, 
by setting a size limit. And Jeremy was the research scientist for the uh, Tasmanian state government. And what he discovered was that the growth rate and the size of maturity of abalone differed greatly within Tasmania. So let's say uh, I'm, uh, the size limit was mm, 25 centimeters. What he discovered is that in some places, the individuals never even reached 25 centimeters. These would be slow-growing habitats. They would never actually get to the size limit. In other places, they, uh, the, where the, the abalone grew much better, they would get to be much greater than 25 centimeters before they were mature. So in those places, in Jeremy's experience, the abalone were gone because all of the individuals had been harvested above the size limit uh, and there was nothing left to reproduce below the size limit because those below the size limit were immature. So what Jeremy concluded was that in Tasmania and in fact in all abalone populations, there are hundreds or thousands of individual stocks with individual growth rates, often only 100 meters apart. One side of a reef might grow rapidly, another side of a reef might grow slowly. And that the appropriate size limit needed to be different for each of those locations. Now, governments cannot possibly have the staff to manage hundreds or even thousands of individual populations uh, uh, with, with different regulations. The only way, the only way that can happen is if the people who are doing the fishing self-organize and, and do it themselves. And, and Jeremy has been working for the last 30 years, I guess, um, uh, organizing groups of local fishing interests to set up local self-management uh, systems. And he, he has coined the term the barefoot ecologist, which is <clears throat> a variation on the Chinese barefoot doctor. Uh, and his idea was that with very little training, fishermen could be taught to determine at what age, at what size, I'm sorry, the abalone mature. And then the local fishing cooperatives, I guess what in France would be called producer organizations, can then set the size limits area by area. Um, and, and this is not unique to abalone, that there are many, many fish stocks that have a great deal of spatial structure. Uh, every bay is different. Every river is different. Uh, and that, uh, again, the, the, it is just not possible for the centralized fisheries management to, uh, to do this. That the only way it can be done is if the fishermen and the regulatory agency collaborate to collect data on the right spatial scale and to set regulations on that right, that right scale. And it will clearly depend for enforcement on the fishing fishermen themselves, that the government can never have people out on every reef measuring the size limits. So you have to find a way to convince the, uh, the uh, individual fishermen that uh, that they have to uh, either obey the rules or the people they work with uh, um, uh, do self-enforcement. If someone's cheating, they have to, uh, they have to turn them in. Um, so as I said, this situation is far from unique. Um, that m almost any sessile invertebrate has this characteristic of very fine scale spatial structure. Um, coral reef fisheries are, are the same. That uh, the productivity of individual coral reef fisheries uh, is 
<clears throat> is, quite, is quite different. So Jeremy has now, for the last 10 years or so, been working with a, a whole range of small-scale fisheries in uh, developing countries in the Western Pacific, Papua New Guinea, uh, Palau, Fiji, um, helping local communities become barefoot ecologists, figuring out how to uh, measure the status of their fish stocks, how to collect the data, and how to set up uh, self-management organizations. Um, we have the same trouble with Pacific salmon, that uh, Pacific salmon, again, have a lot of spatial structure uh, and, uh, in, 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 and uh, they also are very habitat dependent. Uh, and the, uh, it's very difficult for governments to monitor what goes on in individual streams, to uh, understand the habitat in each stream and to, uh, to manage uh, any, any kind of streams individually. In, uh, in Washington State, where I live, those roles have to a great extent been taken over by local fishing groups, fishermen's clubs, things, thing, uh, things like that, or, or uh, on the commercial side, largely by Indian, uh, uh, Indian tribes. And they're the ones who are out there measuring the habitat. They're the ones who are out there protecting the habitat from, uh, from illegal changes in land use. Uh, oops, oh, look at that. Um, and, uh, and, and often, uh, uh, in, where, where, it, where it's needed, helping to supplement the wild production. Um, so one of the places that it's most important for the, the fishermen and, uh, and other groups to collaborate is in these small-scale uh, fisheries. Okay, now let me go to, uh, I'm not quite sure this would count as an industrial fishery in, I think this would still be considered an artisanal fishery in, uh, in the French sense, but the uh, New Zealand rock lobster fishery. Um, that uh, rock lobster is a very valuable resource. I think they currently receive about uh, 80 New Zealand dollars a kilo. Uh, the market is almost completely uh, in Asia. And within New Zealand, there, is a, an, there are about 250 uh, licensed fishermen that have, uh, have fishing boats. Um, and it's a... Uh, it's managed uh, with an individual transferable quota system, so people own the right to catch a certain proportion of the allowable catch. Um, that within the New Zealand system, the rock lobster fishery is by far the most devolved in terms of the industry taking uh, uh, most of the responsibility for management. Um, so this is a uh, New Zealand, is, uh, the economic zone of New Zealand is divided into 10 areas uh, for lobster management and there is a total allowable catch set in each area. Um, let me, I gotta think what, um, okay. So uh, there is an overriding industry group called the Rock Lobster Industry Council and it organizes uh, a program of collecting size and catch data, uh, uh, and often very detailed. So uh, on a voluntary basis, many of the individual fishing boats measure uh, a sample of the uh, lobsters they bring on board, which gives a very detailed, very spatially explicit uh, set of data on the size of the lobsters. <clears throat> The uh, Rock Lobster Industry Council contracts consultants to actually do the stock assessment. That is to uh, take all the data that are available, estimate the current abundance of rock lobster, estimate the exploitation rate, and the history of, of the fishery. Um, the uh, Rock Lobster Industry Council in collaboration with uh, external scientists and with some government, 
uh, has developed harvest control rules. Uh, and that is, this fishery is managed in a somewhat unique way that uh, the, the total allowable catch is determined by the catch per effort in the fishery. So I think that's the, um, well, no, I, um, I'll pop down there. for. So the biggest lobster fishery is the area eight. Uh, and the x-axis is the catch per unit of effort measured in kilograms of lobster in each pot, or kilograms per pot lift. You take the pot out of the water, how many kilograms are there? So this is the harvest control rule that was developed uh, for this area. And you see uh, anywhere from about one and a half kilograms per pot lift above, the quota will be roughly 1,000 tons. Okay? Um, if, the, if it drops below one and a half kilos per pot lift, the catch will be dropped dramatically and if it goes below half a kilogram per pot lift, the fissure will be closed. I won't, I won't go in, and those dots show where the population has been in the last, uh, from 2012 to 2015. And it's been in very good shape, out getting about three kilograms per pot lift. The quota is about uh, 1,000 um, 1, tons. Um, well, let's, let's go to the next slide. This is the history of that fishery going back to 1979. That uh, it was, had been about two kilograms per pot lift, and during the 1980s and 1990s, it just got worse and worse until the early 1990s, it was down to under one kilogram of pot lift. And it was, uh, it was uh, not a very successful fishery. It was difficult for fishermen to make a living at that, at that rate. Uh, and that is when the uh, decision rule was brought into force and they said, what we want to do is build up the catch per effort in this fishery so we don't have to fish as hard to make, to make our quota. And you see it's been, uh, it's been quite successful. The fishery is now up about three kilograms per pot lift. And that was all an initiative of the, uh, the, the fishing industry. The, uh, the government was still stuck in the 1950s in uh, <clears throat> trying to, to figure out how to set a quota for the fishery. And the fishermen said, look, we're out there every day. We know this fishery can be much better. We can have much higher uh, much higher uh, catch per day, catch per pot lift. Um, and, uh, and this was actually, it was not first implemented in this area. It was implemented in another area where there were only about 10 fishermen. It was a great success, and it, it spread throughout all of New Zealand. Let me go back to, um, oops, uh, oops, decision. We'll go back to here. So one of the things the, the fishing industry did was develop the harvest control rule. And then another thing is they will actually, uh, the, the government sets the TACs. They, they set the TACs based on the control rule. Uh, but in some areas, the industry has actually uh, uh, reduced the harvest lower than the TAC if they thought there was a, a threat. Um, uh, and in some cases, that threat has been recreational fishing. Uh, in other cases, it uh, has been apparently poor recruitment. But uh, there's been a number of times the fishing industry has voluntarily reduced the quota rather than waiting for the government process to, uh, to kick in. So what is it? about the New Zealand system that enables this to happen. The first is they have a very strong rule of law. New Zealanders are, by and large, uh, obedient citizens. They pay, they, they, they pay attention to, uh, to laws. And, uh, and fisheries has not traditionally been a highly political activity uh, that uh, the, the uh, 
that it, 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 their fisheries have largely been governed by science. Uh, very important was secure access to the resource. So they have a quota system where the people uh, have the right to catch a certain proportion of the TAC. That's a very valuable right. Um, let me think. It's now worth about a million dollars a ton. That if you have the right to catch, it was two, yeah, it's, I think it's on the order, million New Zealand dollars. That would be maybe 500,000 euros uh, per ton. So a, a typical fisherman might have five tons of, TAC, of ITQ, and that's worth two and a half million dollars. That's a very valuable asset, and they want to protect that asset. Um, another interesting characteristic of the New Zealand lobster industry has been very strong leadership. They've just been very fortunate to have a couple very key individuals who understood the fishery. They were typically ex-fishermen, uh, were, were, were good leaders. Um, and then finally, there's been good relationships between the government, the industry, and the science. Um, just summarize uh, the, the sort of the, some of the key elements of the fisheries management system in the New Zealand rock lobster fishery. The governance is there's an, a national act called the Fisheries Act, and there's a national government, and the minister in charge makes, it has the last word on all decisions. So unlike the European Union, where you have, I don't know, was it 23 people in charge, there's only one person in charge. It's great simplification. The allocation is largely solved. That is, within the, fish, the commercial fishing industry, um, the, uh, everybody knows who gets to catch what. There's just no question about that. Uh, although there is uh, probably the biggest crack in this system is there is no allocation between commercial and recreational. And so the, fish, the, the commercial fishermen in many places are starting to lose their share of the resource because the government is letting recreational fishermen take more. And that's really undermining the security of access and essentially threatening the, uh, the, the, the commercial industry uh, to, to stop becoming guardians of the resource because they don't, you know, if they don't think they will have access in 10 years, they're gonna have a much shorter time horizon than if they do. Um, research and data collection are all done by the industry and it is uh, funded by levies on the quota holders. So the government doesn't pay for any of that. Uh, monitoring, control, and surveillance um, is largely done by the ministry. Uh, combination of sales records and they also employ uh, a fair number of undercover policemen. Um, all of those costs are also paid by the industry. Um, so I've talked the problem with the ITQ pro with program. There's another problem with it, which is uh, that the ownership of the quota has been drifting from fishermen to investors, and that's a, a serious problem. Um, so some general lessons is that local people know local situations. That uh, that the uh, that uh, in the case of rock lobster, you, you know, you have people who've spent their whole life fishing one section of coastline. Um, but all stakeholders need to be involved in how, I've got to say, to get there from here. You need to understand, bring in the stake, all the stakeholders, and in, in the lobster case, it's, it's dominantly commercial interests. Um, but in, uh, incentives, incentives, and incentives. If you want to understand why people behave the way they do, you have to understand the, the system they're in and their incentives. Um, the New Zealand system uh, the, uh, started when one very small fishery uh, and when that harvest control rule data collection system was shown to be successful, it spread rapidly to the other fisheries. Um, it's obviously much easier when you have a single user group. If you have many countries or many different fleets taking the same resource, uh, it's going to be much harder. 
Now, there are a whole gradations of collaboration between, um, uh, between government and, and industry. Um, the, the, the most common model is top-down only. That is, the government does all the elements. Um, the next level is basically the government still controls it, but it does get stakeholder input. Um, then, a little bit more collaborative is the government sets limits, but the industry internally meets the constraints. So I will talk briefly about, um, about an example of that where uh, um, the government in the United States and Alaska sets limits on the bycatch of things like albatrosses, uh, salmon, uh, cer certain species in, in, that are not allowed to be caught or they don't want to be caught in some fisheries. And <clears throat> the industry uh, is the ones, uh, industry is the ones who actually figure out how to solve it. Uh, and they, they do that, uh, well. Uh, then there's true co-management. And, and the best case I can think of that is where uh, the Indian fisheries in Washington state, uh, the, the Indian tribes are equal partners with the, the, the government in managing the fishery. And they, they, they have to agree on the regulations. They share every element of responsibility. And finally, there is a totally devolved form. That is where the entire fishery is turned over to the fishermen. Uh, and the best example of that is uh, artisanal fisheries in, in Chile, um, where since about uh, 19, late, early 1990s, 1995, um, again, uh, these are highly spatially structured, mostly sessile invertebrates. Uh, and the Chileans have a system uh, that, that, that the, the local fishermen's co-op called Caletas uh, can apply to the government for ownership of a section of coastline. I'm, I can't remember how far offshore it goes, but it's, it's primarily the intertidal and immediately subtidal. And a, a typical fishing co cooperative might be given access to 10 kilometers of coastline or two kilometers of coastline. And they then do every element of fishery management. They do the science, they do the enforcement, they do the allocation, they do the marketing. Uh, and I think there are several hundred Caletas now along the Chilean coast that uh, operate under this system. Uh, see, I've probably gotten ahead of myself. Uh, ownership, they divide, yeah, all of that stuff. Whoops, go down one. Okay, why do we need this collaboration between uh, between fishing uh, industries and, um, and governments. First, management is expensive. Um, that uh, when I worked for the Canadian government, uh, the Canadian Department of Fisheries, the budget of the Canadian Department of Fisheries was greater than the landed value of fish in the country. Okay. <laughs> um, that's no longer true, but, but it's still perhaps a third or a half that uh, management is expensive and generally the management of an individual fishery, uh, the costs are lar largely independent of the size of the fishery, uh, that, that it costs almost as much to manage a small fishery as a large fishery. Most fisheries are small fisheries. Uh, and I don't know of any country that is rich enough to actually try to manage all of its fisheries well. For small fisheries, there is no choice that much of the data collection has to be done by the fishing fleets or other interested parties, or you'll never be able to manage those fisheries. Fishermen know more than, uh, than scientists in that they are on the water all of the time. Uh, they, 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 don't, they don't know it in a scientific way, and that's why uh, true collaboration involves training the fishermen uh, to, to, to collect the kind of data that is useful in fisheries. Um, they have extensive knowledge of the biology and the habitats, and they can enforce uh, regulations when incentives are right. Um, there is a... Uh, 
uh, well, there have been a couple cases, but perhaps the most notable case uh, occurred in, uh, up, again, up in Alaska, where uh, there was a, uh, a fisherman, very successful fisherman, uh, also a very successful politician, uh, that, that, not an elected politician, but he was the fisheries advisor to one of the senators from Alaska in the national government. He was one of the 11 voting members of the local uh, regulatory board, and uh, he was cheating. He was reporting fish uh, from, uh, he had the right to catch fish uh, way out in the Aleutian Islands, uh, but he was catching them much closer to port and reporting them, uh, reporting them as having come from the Aleutian Islands. Um, he went to prison for a year. Okay, this is a very well-known, influential man. He went to prison for a year, and uh, you know how he was caught? His crew turned him in. And, and it's, it's, it's happened several times that crews have turned in captains who were cheating uh, because they have an, uh, an interest in doing, doing things right. Um, without collaboration, <laughs> fishermen are going to oppose regulations. This is, this is from Ireland. Uh, I just picked this off the web. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, I, I assume, I mean, I, I, fishermen can get very angry, and, and, and they're also very effective at avoiding regulation in all sorts of ways. And I just had to, uh, uh, had to, had to blow up that picture from there, and I'm, I, I wanna, if anyone knows who that is, I want to collect a reward. Uh, um, tracking catch, there's all sorts of ways that fishermen can help track catch and do it properly, um, and uh, uh, particularly with modern electronics, Fishermen have the ability to provide very detailed data. Um, I'll talk about that in just a second. Tracking uh, abundance and size composition. So the Peruvian Anchoveta industry has uh, a large fleet of boats, and they are now uh, doing large-scale surveys uh, with their entire fleet of boats. They'll, all, the, all the fleet will take two days off and just go out and do surveys with their acoustic sounders uh, in a way that the government, when the government does it, it takes about six weeks to do that survey. The industry can do it all in, in, a, in a day or two. I mentioned the New Zealand rock lobster fishery. Um, regulating fishing pressure, there's definitely a major role for the fishing industry uh, in doing that. Um, reducing bycatch. Um, Bycatch is a, almost always a solvable problem. Uh, and there are just a, a dozen really good examples, whether uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, dolphins in, in tuna fisheries, uh, albatross in longline fisheries, turtles in shrimp fisheries. Uh, we know how to solve those problems. And the best people to to work with and do that are the fishermen because they are actually much better at technology than, uh, than a lot of other people. Um, one of my colleagues uh, in my department has worked extensively on seabird bycatch reduction, and it's always a partnership between science uh, and industry and sometimes government. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but the Alaska fishing cooperatives have got very elaborate systems for reducing bycatch. Uh, that all involve legally binding requirements to close areas when a hired consultant looks at, their, at the daily data and says, this is an area we're getting too much bycatch. Uh, protective, protecting sensitive habitats. Again, fishermen often know exactly where spawning occurs. Uh, they can help identify spawning and rearing areas. Um, sensitive habitats uh, <clears throat> can be... Uh, can be mapped because, again, the fishing fleet is out there far more than, than typically research vessels. Uh, in British Columbia, the, uh, the ground fish trawl industry has come to an agreement with uh, local environmental groups on how to identify and protect sensitive habitats. In this case, it's mostly corals and sponges, and they do this by having individual boat-based quotas on corals and sponges, and if a boat catches more than their allocated amount, they have to stop fishing for the year. And this just, again, provides a very strong incentive 
for those boats to know where they're going to catch corals and sponges and not fish in those places. Uh, enforcement uh, and regulation, uh, there's uh, <clears throat> all sorts of ways that fishing industries have worked uh, with governments to, to do that. I mentioned crew self-policing. Uh, a lot of industries employ observers for uh, a whole bunch of things like bycatch. Uh, let's say a lot of cooperatives have very strong internal penalties for uh, violation of their own cooperative rules. So, in conclusion, for large industrial fisheries in rich countries, the top-down management can be effective, but it is, comes at great cost. For most of the fisheries of the world, the model cannot work, and collaborative management is required. Thanks very much. Hello, thank you very much for your, for your question. Um, my name is Frédéric Lemanac from the, from the, the NGO Bloom. Um, I've been following you for the past few days, and I was in Brussels, and I was in, in Rennes um, last Friday. And I have to say that I, I don't really get where you stand. Um, so I have two examples. Uh, today, I, I had the feeling that uh, you were extremely pro small scale fisheries, saying that we have to to manage fisheries on a very small scale because uh, most uh, fisheries are small scale, and indeed they are. Um, yet in Brussels uh, and in Rennes, I had the feeling that you were pro large scale fisheries. Um, and for example, in Brussels, you said that. A dead fish is a dead fish. I don't care whether it was caught by a 130 meters trawler or a thousand small scale fishers. You said that in Brussels, right? And then in Rennes, you said that, uh, no, I think it was in Brussels as well. You said that uh, it was a lot more efficient to have large scale vessels because they are a lot more efficient to, to control. So where do you stand? Um, and my second question, my second where do you stand question, um, is about the bycatch. So today you, today you just said that um, a good fishery is a fishery that manages its bycatch, its bycatch. So a good fishery has to reduce its bycatch to the minimum. Um, yet in Brussels, in Rennes, you said that uh, if you had to choose between tuna cut, uh, between per seine cut and pollen line cut tuna, you would choose per scene because it was a lot more efficient uh, from a, a carbon footprint perspective. Uh, and that you didn't care about the shark bycatch because what you, what, what you do care is the, is the carbon footprint. So where do you stand? Thank you. Okay. Um, first, when it comes to, uh, boy, comes to small scale or large scale, I don't have an opinion. Uh, you know, I'm, that's, that's not a scientific question. Uh, it's not as if one is good and one is bad. Um, for some kinds of fisheries, uh, it has to be small scale. I mean, you're not going to be using large industrial boats in certain fisheries. Um, there, are, there are scientific aspects. So, for instance, it is much easier to monitor a few large vessels than a lot of small vessels. That's just a fact. That's not an opinion. That's a fact. Um, but should we, should we, should we replace the, the small fisheries of the world with large vessels? That's not a science question. Um, and uh, I mean, I think there's a place for both. Um, without, without a doubt, there's a, there's a, there's a place for both. Um, obviously, as I said, you can't, hmm, that's the problem. What am I listening to that for? Um, <laughs> you, you, <laughs> You can't uh, use large vessels in many fisheries. You're not going to use large vessels for abalone. You're not going to use large vessels for rock lobster. Um, but you're not going to use small vessels for pollock in Alaska. I mean, you need, I mean, at a minimum, uh, you need 30 meter boats. Uh, that, that it's, just, it's just not an option. Um, so, uh, uh, there, you know, there's a place for both. And uh, certainly, in some places, there is competition between them. Again, 
That's not a science question. Uh, I, and I, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not for me to say which one, which one you want. Um, on the bycatch question, uh, certainly uh, we want to reduce bycatch wherever possible uh, within any fishery. So in the per seine fisheries of, uh, of tuna fisheries, uh, there, there, there are ways to reduce the bycatch of those tuna fisheries. And it, you know, it's very complicated because it used to be that uh, in, the, in the Eastern Pacific, there was an enormous bycatch of, of, uh, of porpoises. Um, I always get porpoises and dolphins confused, but uh, spinner dolphin, dolphins. Um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, they, 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 some certain NGOs came, came down on the fishery uh, big time. Uh, the fishermen uh, developed some techniques to uh, dramatically reduce the, the bycatch from hundreds of thousands to hun hundreds. Um, but another technique that was used to reduce the bycatch was to start fad fishing. Well, fad fishing has other aspects of bycatch. Uh, with respect to, in, in this case, my personal choice, I would choose, I'm, I'm more worried about carbon footprint then I'm worried about the bycatch in per se uh, fisheries at the moment. But that's not a science question. That's my, that's my personal choice. I think carbon is a bigger threat than, uh, than the bycatch in, in those fisheries. But there's just, you know, if we did our incentives right, we could dramatically reduce that bycatch. So I, I've seen papers, oh, I'm talking very fast, I'm sorry. Uh, um, seen, uh, someone I know quite well uh, has showed that the bycatch per ton is much, much smaller at fads if you set on a large number of tuna at the fad. That is, the bycatch is reasonably constant uh, per set. And uh, all we'd have to do is figure out how to get the fleet to not set on low concentration fads and do few uh, uh, few set uh, you know do a few big sets rather than many many small sets but I you know I don't work in tuna fisheries anymore uh, but again I want to emphasize some of these things are scientific questions and some are personal choice next question oui je vais la poser en français euh, ça va ouvrir ouvrir la porte aux autres questions en français euh, Ray en fait j'aurais voulu savoir si euh, euh, comme c'est le cas en Norvège, euh, euh, vous avez en Amérique du Nord euh, des, ce que, ce que j'appellerais les quotas scientifiques. C'est-à-dire véritablement, un, euh, pour, on parlait justement d'incentives de, 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 pour, les, pour les professionnels de la pêche, euh, c'est-à-dire vraiment un, un quota euh, qui, est, qui est donné donc, par l'État euh, à des organismes scientifiques. Hein, c'est le cas euh, avec nos collègues norvégiens de l'IMR, euh, et qui ensuite va permettre aux scientifiques de discuter avec les professionnels pour travailler sur des sujets ensemble. En fait, une fa... et, et les professionnels auront une capacité de pêche supérieure, auront un quota complémentaire euh, en travaillant avec les scientifiques. Quoi. Donc c'est une façon d'être obligé de travailler ensemble, en fait, ce qui est plutôt une bonne chose, même si on travaille ensemble sans cela. Mais euh, euh, voilà, est-ce est, est que ça existe euh, en Amérique du Nord I think that's what we would call research quotas. Yeah. So some portion of the total allowable catch would be set aside for various research projects. And they might be surveys, they might be gear trials, um, thing, things, uh, things like that. Uh, so it's certainly not unknown. It's not, uh, it's not real common, although uh, a lot of our surveys are done by um, commercial vessels. Uh, that is, the government charters a commercial vessel. Uh, and I think depending upon the fishery, the, uh, the payment may consist of the fish that are caught uh, um, uh, and, and with some, presumably some guarantee for how much they will get a day. But uh, it's not, not unknown, but I would say it's not, uh, it's not really common. Uh, and again, in the in the a lot of the fisheries I've worked in, the uh, the fishermen themselves have recognized that they need better data. That uh, especially in Canada, 
after the collapse of the cod fishery, the government became very, very cautious. Um, and uh, they, 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 and that, uh, you know, it basically uh, the fishermen in quite a few fisheries I, I know of uh, said, look, get, we just don't have good enough data. So for instance, uh, in the Western Canada, they did not have any survey of the ground fish. Very common. I mean, you have lots of surveys in Europe. U.S. has surveys, and they didn't have it. So the industry said, look, we're not going to be able to fish if we don't have surveys, and they started uh, paying to have surveys done. And in this case, they would uh, typically uh, pay the government to put a couple people to help design uh, and, and more or less run the survey, but the survey would be done by an industry vessel, but paid for by out of the aggregate fishing fleet. Oui, d'abord, je voudrais vous remercier de d'être présent et d'avoir euh, témoigné ici parce que on en a assez euh, des discours euh, catastrophistes sur les pêches et vous apportez un point de vue euh, non pas euh, d'un optimisme délirant, parce que la situation n'est pas toujours excellente, mais en tout cas de la possibilité d'une gestion collective et qui permet, on le voit dans plusieurs endroits, de redresser la situation. Donc merci pour ça, parce que ça, ça fait du bien d'entendre des, des choses de ce genre. La deuxième chose pour laquelle je, vous, je voudrais vous remercier, c'est effectivement ce ce discours qui met en avant la, la collaboration et la participation des pêcheurs dans la gestion. C'est vraiment quelque chose d'essentiel. De, Il y a un point sur lequel je suis cependant en désaccord avec vous, c'est votre, même si c'est un peu nuancé parce que vous, vous développez plusieurs points de vue sur les modèles de gestion, mais votre défense des quotas transférables. Euh, je pense que c'est une optique assez dangereuse. D'ailleurs, vous, vous, avez, vous avez cité un certain nombre de dérives possibles et, et réelles, y compris dans, euh, en Nouvelle-Zélande. On a, dans les expériences qui existent aujourd'hui, quand même depuis euh, plusieurs décennies, quand on regarde l'Islande, quand on regarde euh, même ce qui se passe aujourd'hui en, en Angleterre, on vient d'apprendre là que il y a des bateaux espagnols qui trafiquaient sur les quotas, des les, les, les Anglais qui leur transféraient des quotas, etc. Il y a, il y a vraiment une difficulté à contrôler la concentration de ces quotas parce que quand on met en avant la, la, cette dynamique, c'est que c'est quelque chose qui échappe, je, je dirais qui échappe au contrôle à la fois du gouvernement et puis de, de, souvent de, de, de la société et même de l'ensemble des pêcheurs. Il y a ce qu'on appelle les barons des pêches qui s'installent euh, plus ou moins clandestinement. Donc c'est vraiment une grosse difficulté. C'est-à-dire je pense qu'il est toujours important de conserver un contrôle collectif et public sur une ressource qui est une ressource qui est une ressource commune. Donc cette privatisation, je trouve qu'elle est, qu est dangereuse. Ceci étant dit, tout, tout le reste... de ces exemples que vous citez me paraissent tout à fait, euh, tout à fait pertinents. Voilà, merci. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, it's still on. Um, first, let me clarify. I'm, I would not call myself an ITQ supporter. I'd, I'd say I'm increasingly an ITQ skeptic. Um, I mean, I've been involved in, uh, actually, I worked in the, one of the first ITQ fisheries, which was the abalone fishery in Tasmania. Um, and ITQs were a great improvement over what existed before. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, during the early 1990s, I would say I was, well, the, the 1990s, I was an ITQ supporter because I worked in many ITQ fisheries. And it had changed things dramatically uh, from uh, competitive fisheries uh, to uh, collaborative fisheries. But uh, I'd say the, the bloom is off. Um, and in particular, the question you identified, the uh, concentration of ownership often outside of the, uh, of the fishing industry um, is, uh, is, a real, is, a, is a real concern. 
Um, so in some of the New Zealand inshore fisheries, you now, uh, the people who are fishing do not own quota. They're, they're basically fishing for quota owners uh, and they're competing and often racing to fish just uh, like it was uh, before. So now there may be ways to fine tune ITQ systems, but I, I don't think we will see any more in the US. I think we're looking much more at various kinds of alloca allocation to cooperatives or producer organizations. Um, uh, but uh, it's a really interesting subject. Uh, I don't think we have the right, necessarily the right model. I was really interested to learn how the French producer organizations allocate the right to catch and also how, how people enter the fishery because that's a problem you have in ITQ fisheries is you just simply can't get in unless you have access to millions of dollars of uh, loans, which is why you get concentration. Um, and a, a very good friend of mine was, was a very successful American uh, longline fisherman. Uh, uh, you know, when we went, we went into the halibut fishery, the, 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 the ITQ system, it had been lasting one day a year. All the halibut were caught in one day. Uh, one year, I can't remember what she is, 1993, a storm struck, six people died, because if they didn't go fishing that day, they wouldn't make any money. We went into an ITQ system. The thing lasts six, year, six, 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 uh, six months now. The price fishermen received sort was a great success. It was safer, it was richer, it was easier to manage, okay? But, uh, this, I say this friend of mine was the leader of one of the industry organizations. Uh, he did very well. Uh, he, he got the highest quota of one of the species, black cod, of any American citizen. He's now retired, uh, and he is totally disappointed in how the system, he says, I thought we could keep this from happening, that is, the concentration and the drifting uh, of ownership. Uh, the halibut fishery requires the owner is on board for a certain portion of the year. So what investors do is they, uh, they, they we call them slipper skippers, that they, they have a stateroom with all of their business equipment and they spend six weeks on board the ship. They know nothing about fishing, right? Uh, so they found ways around those regulations. Uh, so we have a lot to learn about, we, I mean, there are clear benefits to that kind of a system, but there are also some severe disadvantages and maybe ITQs need to be fine-tuned or maybe we need another model. I don't, I don't know, but I think it's one of the most interesting and pressing issues in uh, the fisheries management world. Um, for developed countries, it's never going to be a solution in developing countries, uh, you know, but for industrial and, well, not just in, I mean, I, I, I use industrial to distinguish from recreational. Um, obviously, it has a different meaning here. Um, but for uh, commercial fisheries in developed countries, uh, it's a possibility, but I, I, I think there are better ways, but I don't know exactly what they are. Oui, merci au professeur Rayleigh Borne. Moi, j'ai suivi aussi la conférence de Rennes et j'ai également suivi ce qui s'est dit ce matin à la direction des organisations de producteurs. Et, et je trouve d'abord que les exemples qui ont été choisis complètent bien euh, ce que nous connaissons euh, aussi en France sur euh, les liens qui existent entre les scientifiques et euh, les professionnels, particulièrement ceux qui touchent ce qu'on appelle les petites pêches ou euh, la pêche artisanale. Il est clair, il est évident que dans les années qui vont venir, et on a insisté à Rennes sur quand même, euh, il y avait un exposé, alors l'exposé de Rayleigh Born était très intéressant, celui de Didier Casquel aussi, il y avait un exposé qui était aussi très important, c'était celui de Lévi Le Pape, sur la dégradation considérable des habitats essentiels, et en particulier sur le fait que, euh, on peut dire, les autres usages que la pêche ne font strictement pas attention à la qualité soit des estuaires, soit euh, des zones de bassin ou des zones lagunaires en Méditerranée, ou euh, sur les zones littorales avec comme l'a montré Olivier Le Pape, donc une dégradation très forte des habitats essentiels pour plus de 50% des espèces 
qui forment ce qu'on peut dire le panier de la ménagère. Et à chaque fois, la variable d'ajustement, et il faut bien le dire également aussi, la victime expiatoire, c'est la pêche. Donc il est clair que euh, on a vu au cours de ces dernières années, il y aura un exposé d'ailleurs à Paris qui se fera sur la trajectoire de la flottille française, euh, qu'on a vu diminuer de plus en plus les communautés maritimes, les communautés de pêcheurs, euh, et on perd également de plus en plus un savoir et un savoir-faire qui est absolument indispensable à la connaissance de ces petits habitats, de ces milieux essentiels. Parce que, comme l'a rappelé euh, le professeur Hilborn, donc euh, c'est le cas au Chili, c'est le cas au Canada, c'est le cas en Nouvelle-Zélande, mais c'est aussi le cas en France, on ne pourra pas, dans tous les cas, euh, mettre la science, euh, je dirais, euh, à toutes les sauces, en sens que les milieux sont tellement diversifiés, les milieux sont tellement complexes, les habitats euh, sont tellement difficiles à inventorier dans les zones littorales, les zones estuariennes et les zones, on peut dire, très côtières, que sans la connaissance de ces euh, populations de pêcheurs, on ne s'en sortira pas. Donc ce qui, euh, moi, me semble important, c'est vrai, c'est euh, d'essayer le plus possible de privilégier ce qu'on appelle la fonction. Alors on a vu que le pêcheur, d'abord, c'est fait pour pêcher, il hein, ne faut pas l'oublier, et ramener du poisson, et je le dirais, à un prix raisonnable, de la manière à ce que tout le monde puisse en bénéficier, c'est la fonction première. Mais il y a une fonction également qu'il va falloir mettre en évidence et qu'on commence à mettre en évidence, c'est la fonction de veille environnementale et justement l'utilisation de ces connaissances pour la gestion de ces ressources qui sont des ressources excessivement importantes. C'est le commentaire que je voulais vous faire. Non, je, juste euh, pour remercier, comme euh, c'était fait, hein, Olivier Nézette, président du comité des pêches de Bretagne, pour remercier le professeur Railborn d'être venu en Bretagne, et je pense euh, en France, c'est important, surtout d'avoir une vision euh, différente, sachant que je pense que les propos qui ont été tenus euh, au-delà des, des remarques qui ont été faites, il y a une chose qui est assez remarquable euh, par les pêcheurs français et bretons, c'est que la, le partenariat euh, scientifique pêcheur existe bien, et que je pense qu'il faut le souligner parce que c'est quand même quelque chose d'important. Sur un autre aspect, je mettrai aussi en avant que la ressource, c'est un bien commun. Et que les pêcheurs sont avant tout, et aujourd'hui, les pêcheurs d'aujourd'hui, il y en a dans la salle, sont bien pour la continuité d'une pêche durable avec une approche qui soit sur les piliers du développement durable, c'est-à-dire en prenant en compte l'économique, le social et l'environnemental. Et pas seulement que de l'environnemental, parce que j'ai entendu certaines remarques d'une association que je ne citerai pas parce qu'il n'y a pas lieu de la citer, elle est connue, avec quelques adhérents, je crois, très peu. Mais je pense qu'il est important qu'au-delà de cet épiphénomène, surtout d'apporter une approche constructive des professionnels et de la filière. On a parlé des pro de la production, on a parlé de la valorisation, mais il est aussi important de rappeler que la pêche professionnelle, elle est là et avant tout pour nourrir aussi les gens, au même titre que l'agroalimentaire euh, global. Et le dernier élément, pour clôturer, je pense qu'il ne faut pas oublier la filière aval, parce que derrière, c'est important d'avoir une transformation et une élaboration des produits qui soient de qualité. Parce que le maître mot aujourd'hui de la ménagère, c'est aussi d'avoir des produits de qualité à des coûts euh, aussi euh, qui permettent à n'importe quelle personne de pouvoir acheter des produits de la mer. Donc euh, on est bien tous d'accord pour avoir une une ressource euh, importante qui permette à tout le monde de pouvoir vivre de leur métier et, et, et de produire des, des aliments euh, nutritionnels de qualité. Mais aussi, on a oublié un élément que vous avez très peu cité, que moi j'aurais souhaité qu'on qu qu développe euh, plus, c'est sur la qualité des eaux. La qualité de l'eau et le, 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 le talon d'Achille de la ressource halutique. Et je pense qu'il euh, y a des directives européennes, internationales, qui mettent bien avant que la mer doit être sain, propre et productive. Et pour cela, je pense qu'il est important de développer ce genre d'approche de, 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 et qui permettra justement d'avoir une, une ressource durable. Euh, oui, donc c'est une, une sorte de conclusion, hein, je crois. En tout cas, c'est vrai que comme tu l'as dit, le, bon, je pense que 
le, le partenariat effectivement entre professionnels et scientifiques euh, existe. Hein. On essaye, bon, on le, on, est, on le montre concrètement tous les jours dans les nombreux projets que nous que nous montons ensemble. Évidemment, on voudrait en faire plus. Hein. Enfin, d'ailleurs, Ray nous a donné quelques clés sur, et, et aussi pourquoi effectivement il faut impliquer de plus en plus les professionnels de la pêche. Hein. Donc, ben, on essaiera de, de continuer sur ce chemin-là et d'aller plus loin, bien sûr, avec les, tout, tous les soutiens que nous pouvons avoir. Voilà, bon, bah, écoutez, je ne vais, je vais rien rajouter de plus. Euh, euh, remercier à nouveau vraiment infiniment euh, Ray d'être venu nous voir euh, à Lorient et puis aussi en, en Bretagne hein, et puis de continuer son chemin. Je sais qu'il est passé à Bruxelles avant et puis il va continuer son chemin à Paris donc euh, pour euh, plusieurs conférences encore intéressantes. Euh, merci infiniment vraiment d'être venu nous voir et de d'échanger avec nous d'ailleurs, ben on va, on va s'échanger nos, nos PowerPoint hein, qu'on a avec les, les noms de chacun pour, je l'espère, euh, euh, monter des projets dans les, dans les années à venir. Voilà. Et merci à tous de votre présence. Bonne soirée.